our next speaker is Team Star. Um, personally, for me, I'm happy that I can announce this talk. I own an Apple device, but for me, the point of owning this Apple device is that it just works, right? I don't like to tinker with that specific device. So I'm very grateful that there are people who actually would like to think, uh, tinker with Apple devices, such as Team Star. Um, so personally, I'm looking forward to learning all about uh, downgrading iOS, uh, how it worked in the past, how it works in the present, and what new that what new will be in the presentation that Team Star can teach us. So with that. Um, I would like to ask all of you to give Teamstar a warm round of applause. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm Teamstar, and I'm going to present you downgrading iOS from past to present. So the topics of this talk will be the iOS boot chain and how it changed through the versions. Uh, I'm going to talk about SHSH blobs and AP tickets, what those are. Um, I'm going to talk about the past downgrade methods, um, real quick intro on IMG3 and IMG4 file format. Um, then I'm going to tell you what the baseband and SEPOS problem is, which we encounter while downgrading. And at the end, there is something new for 64-bit devices. So this is the iOS boot chain. Um, I'm going to see this picture a few times in this presentation, but basically right here we have two routes. We have the normal boot and we have the DFU boot. The DFU is the device firmware upgrade, um, if you upgrade the device. So yeah, what you can see here is that uh, the boot ROM first boots the first stage bootloader, uh, the first stage bootloader boots the second stage bootloader, which is iBoot and normal boot, or iBag if you go the restore route. If you go the normal boot route, then the kernel boots, and for 64-bit devices, this is new, the SAP OS boots, what that is, uh, I'm going to talk in a few slides. If you go the DFU route, um, then the RAM disk and the kernel is booted. This is much like a live system, and you use that for restoring. So, yeah, let's talk a bit about iOS history. With the uh, iPhone 2G, we had iPhone, uh, iPhone OS 1 and iPhone OS 2 two and three, and they were pre-signed, and downgrade was just possible. There was like nothing stopping you from downgrading that. This changed a bit in iPhone 3G. Well, it didn't change in iPhone OS 2 and 3. It was basically the same, but it changed with iOS 4. On the iPhone 3G, Apple added software SHSH checks, and downgrade was still possible with a few hacks. So let's take a look at the boot chain of an iPhone 3G, iOS 4. Um, I want to note real quick, uh, I'm only talking about iPhones, uh, but this also applies to iPads and iPods of, with the same hardware, so uh, keep that in mind. So what you can see here, that the uh, boot components check each other, like uh, first stage bootloader checks the second stage bootloader, second stage bootloader checks the kernel and the RAM disk and so on. But you can see here they're missing uh, one thing, the boot ROM doesn't check the first stage bootloader, doesn't check ILB or IBSS, so if you want to go back to iOS 3, 2 or 1, you could just do it. The boot ROM doesn't check, doesn't prevent that. So what are those SHSH blobs I'm talking about? Well, Apple introduced those to control what iOS version can be installed on your device. And those need to be requested from Apple while restoring. And an SHSH blob is basically a signed hash plus the asset of the device. So um, those makes them unique for every device. You can't just take one SHSH blob from one device and try to use it with a different device. That won't work because the ESET is different. So um, let's take a look at SHSH and IMG3 file format. So on the left image, you can see the grammar for an IMG3 file. Basically, we have some magic, we have some sizes, and we have a bunch of IMG3 tags, and those are actually interesting ones. And those, um, what those IMG3 tags can be, you can see on the right. This is a picture taken from the iPhone wiki. And those files contain stuff like the iBoot version, what chip this firmware is to be used on, and you can also see SHSH. And the SHSH is basically an RSA encrypted SHA-1 hash of the file. So this is how it looks like if you open it up in a hex editor. You can see a bunch of uh, IMG3 uh, tags, and the one which I highlighted is the SHSH tag. So yeah, it's basically the RSR1 encrypted SHA-1 hash. 
And below this SHS H blob, what you can't really see here, is a certificate which contains Apple's public key, which you can use to verify that signature. So let's continue with the iOS history. With iPhone 3GS and the iPhone 4, um, things changed a bit. With iOS 3 to iOS 4, uh, Apple had hardware-enforced um, SHSH checks. Those were new in those two uh, devices. And starting with iOS uh, 5, um, Apple introduced AP tickets, but what that is, um, we'll see later. So this is how the boot chain looks like on pre-iOS 5, on iPhone 4 and iPhone 3GS. And you can see the only difference here is that the boot ROM does verify the SHSH blobs. So that's actually the only difference. How do we downgrade this? Well, um, SHSH blob is just a signed hash of the firmware. So there's nothing which prevents us from a downgrade attack. What you would do is you save SHSH blobs while they're signed and there are a bunch of tools which can do that. For example, Tiny Umbrella can do that, Cydia, iFade. And when Apple doesn't sign them anymore, you can just reply them. So what you would do is you hook up your device up to iTunes. And when iTunes would ask the Apple server, you'd just man in the middle of the traffic and send the blobs you saved. And iTunes would give it to the device and the device would accept it and you could downgrade. Okay. So what are those AP tickets? AP tickets is uh, ISN1 formatted container. It contains an ESID, a board ID, chip ID, and the hashes of all the firmware files, and a nonce, and it's obviously signed, so you can't tamper with that data. Those uh, things are packed inside an IMG3 file and flashed along with the boot files. So this is how the boot chain looks like on all 32-bit devices on iOS 5 uh, and later. What you can see here, the boot ROM still checks uh, for the SHSH blobs, but if you go the uh, DFU round, route, uh, the uh, IBSS checks now with the AP ticket instead of the single SHSH one. And what it actually does when it boots up IBSS, it would generate a nonce, and this is random. And what you need to do is you need to read out that nonce from the device. You need to uh, request an AP ticket for that specific nonce. Then you could stitch that nonce to IBAC and then you could boot IBAC and then you would do the same for IBAC. So you would read out the nonce, you would stitch it to the remnant and the kernel and you can boot those. For the normal boot, um, the ILB and iBoot also checks the AP ticket, but they don't check the nonce. Well, this is because um, can't really uh, check the nonce, because if you would the nonce, um, generate the nonce randomly, then you would have to request a new ticket for every single boot, and since the device is in bootloader, it can't really do that, so nonce is ignored on normal boot, and this is fine. So this is how an AP ticket looks like if you decode it with ISN1. Uh, so in the left image, you can see it as one decoded. The right image is a build manifest taken from an iPhone firmware file. So at the left, the first thing you can see is the ESET of the device this blobs belongs to. Then you have a bunch of hashes and those actually correspond to the one you can see in the build manifest. So the one I highlighted there is the Apple logo hash. Then you can see the nonce, the iBoot version and a bunch of other stuff. And at the very bottom, you have the signature. And below the signature is a certificate, which you can use to verify the um, signature. So if you pack that inside an IMG3 file, there's nothing too special about it. This is how it looks like. You can see the um, identifier here is SCAB. You need to uh, read that little endian. So that's basically just the AP ticket. And storing all those information about the device in one single file um, removes the need to have it in bunch of files, so it just collects all in one place. So how do we downgrade? Well, we have LimeRain. LimeRain is a boot ROM exploit from GeoHot, and it works up to the iPhone 4. <coughs> it's patched to in the iPhone 4S, but up to the iPhone 4 it works. And we can make the boot ROM boot anything we want. So what we could do is we could patch out the uh, AP ticket checks in IBSS and IBAC, and then we could boot IBSS, IBAC, RAM disk, and the kernel without any AP ticket. What we would do then is we would restore with the previously saved AP ticket, and since the nonce isn't checked on normal boot, we're good to go. 
So this is uh, an image visualizing the uh, downgrade using LimeRain. First step, you pawn a boot ROM, then you um, send a patched IBSS, IBAC kernel RAM disk, and so on. Simply restore. And then if you restore with a valid ticket, you can see uh, that everything from there is valid if you go the normal boot route. So what about newer devices where we don't have LimeRain? Well, first, some background info. Firmware files are encrypted, and the decryption is not possible uh, anymore when the kernel has booted. This is disabled by hardware since the iPhone 4S. So before the iPhone 4S, you could actually decrypt it with the iOS engine on the phone. But since the iPhone 4S, this is disabled by hardware, and you can't use it anymore once the kernel has booted once. And yeah, so basically to get the keys, you need either iBoot or a bootrom exploit. But luckily in the Jabber community, we have some people who have private iBoot exploits on we, and we have people who have private hardware hacking techniques. And those people, they're able to get uh, the firmware ke keys and they're so kind to share them with us. Uh, you can find them on the iPhone wiki. So yeah, they're publicly available for many device and iOS combinations, not for all, but for a lot of them. Also, we have Kloader by WinOCM, and what it could do, it could bootstrap a raw image from kernel mode. So what you could do uh, then is something like jumping back to the bootloader, for example, by booting IBSS. So taking all these possibilities, um, we have Odysseus. Odysseus is a technique by Xerop. He uses a jailbreak, he uses a task to put zero on Kloader to bootstrap an IBSS. I personally call this KDFU mode, kernel DFU mode. It is uh, similar to the pawn DFU mode with LimeRain, where it would like accept anything um, which you would give it, it would just boot it. You can do the same if you um, bootstrap uh, decrypted and patched uh, IBSS. But the only difference is, since uh, in kernel the mode the kernel has booted once, um, the IS engine is disabled, so this means you cannot decrypt firmware um, files anymore. Um, so the solution to this problem is we simply build the custom firmware and send the firmware files decrypted already. So yeah, we decrypt IBSS, IBAC, Remnus and kernel and the file system and just send it so the device doesn't need to decrypt them. And we can do that. So this is what it looks like if we're downgrading using Odysseus. The first thing you have here is the normal boot. You boot up the old ILB, and in this case, old means before the downgrade and new means after the downgrade. Uh, boot RAM verifies ILB, ILB verifies iBoot, and so on to the kernel. Then you pawn the kernel, you jailbreak the kernel, you enable task for pit zero, then you run Kloader and boot a uh, uh, patched and decrypted IBSS, and this is what I call KDFU mode, and this is because if your device booted IBSS, it behaves to the outside world like as if it would be in KDFU mode, so the outside world couldn't tell if it's actually IBSS or KDFU mode, uh, or DFU mode, so this is why I call this KDFU mode. What you would do then is boot a decrypted and patched IBAC, and decrypted and patched Remnus and kernel, then you would simply run a normal restore, but you would restore a valid AP ticket. And if you try to boot then, bootrom verifies ILB. Uh, in the AP ticket, the nonce is ignored, so you're good to go and you could boot. So this is really cool, but in this talk I haven't talked about the basebind. The basebind is a processor um, which handles communication like when you're trying to call someone and stuff like that. And the security um, of the basement has improved too, and the downgrade is not really possible. Um, also, less people care uh, about basement at all since carriers start to unlock phones. So, in the earlier days of iPhones, the reason why I would want to hack the basement is because the carrier would sell a SIM locked phone and you want to use the phone with a different carrier. So, you would try to hack the basement and get an unlock so you can use the phone with a different SIM card. But since carriers start to sell unlocked phones, don't really need that anymore. But from the earlier days, the uh, common practice became not to update the baseband because uh, security proved that too. Uh, what you would do is when you're upgrading the iOS, you would keep the old baseband, 
So um, you could still keep all the uh, vulnerabilities and exploit it again. And when you jailbreak the device, you could then exploit again the basement and you could unlock your phone. And from those times, we know that many non-default iOS basement combinations are working, combinations that weren't shipped. Uh, some are not, but uh, lots of them are working. So yeah, we know that the uh, new iOS and old basement works, but the other way around works um, too, if the gap isn't too big. So Odysseus uses this fact, it keeps the basement with its signature when downgrading, uh, since the iPhone 4S, the basement is stored in a file system. Before that, it's stored on some memory, but um, since 4S, it's on a file system. And this is why uh, you need to patch the firmware for not updating um, the basement. So what you would actually do, you would grab the old basement from the phone, create a custom firmware where you put this old basement in, and you would flash the new, uh, the custom firmware with the old basement. So. Then uh, we have Odysseus OTA. So um, Apple signs OTA blobs for iOS 6.1.3 for the iPhone 4S and for the iPad 2. And what exactly are those OTA blobs? Well, OTA means over the air. If you update your device, um, not using iTunes, but if you go to settings and update and just download the uh, um, firmware and updates, and this is what we call an OTA update. And Apple signs uh, 6.1.3 for these two devices because those were shipped initially with iOS 5. And for some reason, you can't just straight go from iOS 5 to iOS 9 or think you can't even go to iOS 8. So what you would need to do if those devices are still in iOS 5, you would need to upgrade first to 6.1.3 and from there you could go to iOS 9. And same applies for iOS 8.4.1 for some other devices. So the idea with Odysseus OTA is to use fresh OTA tickets. And uh, you can also grab a basement ticket, since that's sign too. And this allows us to actually downgrade the basement, because the only thing which was uh, stopping us from downgrading the basement is the fact that it wasn't signed. But since it's signed here, we could just grab tickets and downgrade it. This was, this, this was discovered by Xyrup and me around the same time. We're using different techniques, like I'm patching the firmware bundles you use to generate the custom firmware. He added the command line parameter to iDevice Restore, where you pass a build manifest, but it's basically the same thing. So um, normal um, AP ticket and OTA ticket only differ by the RAM disk cache. And this also makes sense, because if you're uh, upgrading using iTunes, you, you want the uh, upgrade process to be handled by iTunes, but if you're upgrading using the OTA method, you want your phone to do it on its own without iTunes, so we need to boot a different RAM disk. And the hash of the RAM disk doesn't really matter because we're um, booting that thing with K-Loader anyway, so no nonsense, no nothing is checked. So Odysseus is cool, but it also has uh, some limitations. It only works for 32-bit devices, and you need firmware keys because, um, yeah, the, the device can't handle the uh, decryption, you need to decrypt it. Um, you also need custom bundles, so you know how to uh, make the custom firmware, you need all these patches, and those are not available for uh, all device and iOS combinations. So, what about 64-bit devices? Well, let's have first some background info. With 64-bit devices, Apple switched to the uh, IMG4 file format. And we also have a new enemy, the Secure Enclave Processor, or short SAP. And SAP is used for Touch ID, it's used for uh, file system encryption and some other things, and it's definitely required for booting, so you can't just decide to not boot it and use your phone, this won't work, because you wouldn't be able to decrypt your file system. SAP has its own nonce uh, inside the AP ticket, and those need to match the one SAP generates when it boots. So also, there are no known exploits for ZAP, so for those who expected uh, a zero day for ZAP to be dropped, I'm sorry, no exploits for ZAP. So yeah, let's take a look at the IMG4 file format. IMG4 is an ISN1 formatted container, this is the R encoded, and what a signed IMG4 basically is, it's just the IM4P, this is the payload, this is like uh, just a 
boot file, iBoot or something like that, with an IM4M, and IM4M is the manifest, and the manifest is basically the AP ticket. And uh, the interesting thing here is that every IMG4 file has uh, its own copy of the manifest of the ticket. This eliminates the need for a ticket-only file like we used to have with the IMG3 file format. And this is probably required for ZEP because all bootloader files are flashed to some memory except for ZEP. ZEP is the only thing which is stored on a file system and this is maybe why they uh, made a single copy of the ticket to every file. So yeah, let's take a look at the IMG4 file format. You could see here on the left side, this is if you just simply ASN1 decrypt, uh, decode the file, you can see IMG4, IM4P, and the tag of uh, that file, this is SEPI, this is a uh, SEPOS, which is um, yeah, displayed right here. Then you have the actual SEP, then you have the keyback, and the keyback is actually uh, an en encrypted key which the device could decrypt and it could use that key to decrypt the firmware. So um, below that you have the IM4M, this is basically the manifest, but you can actually see that better on the right image. Right image is what IMG4 tool gives you if you just display the file. Um, basically also the keybacks and you can see there IM4M and I walk through all those uh, things real quick. The BNCH is the AP nonce, um, which is inside the ticket. Then you have some device specific uh, data. You have the ESIT for um, which, which device, uh, which specific unique device this uh, ticket can be used. And the SNON is the SEP nonce, and SRVN is the server nonce. Uh, it's basically nonce the server generates, so even if you request um, over and over again a ticket with the same parameters, you would still get a different ticket because the server nonce changes. And as far as I know, the server nonce is not really used for anything. So below that, you have a bunch of uh, hashes from all the different files. Right here, you can see the hash for the bat zero uh, image. So this is how the boot chain looks like on 64-bit devices. Um, if you go the normal boot route, the only thing which really changed there is starting with the boot ROM. The AP ticket is changed. Earlier this was the SHSH. And if you go the DFU uh, route, um, not only the, the boot ROM checks the AP ticket and generates an AP nonce, so actually you need to request an AP nonce from the boot ROM and so on, but you also need to request a ZEP nonce and put it inside your ticket. Um, yeah, so we've seen this all improved a lot, but can we still downgrade? And yes, we can. So let's make a downgrade plan for 64-bit devices. Well, we know that the baseband and iOS mismatch works, and what if this would work for SEP2? That would be cool, right? And also every IMG4 file contains uh, its own copy of the AP ticket. But do they actually need to be the same? Well, let's continue with our plan here. What I did here is uh, I made a little tool, uh, I get nonce. Basically, all it does, it fetches the AP nonce and the SEP nonce from the device in all the different modes. What I did then, I took my iPhone 5S, uh, put it in DFU mode, connected it to computer, and read out the nonces um, yeah, for AP and SEP nonce. What I did then is I requested a ticket for those two specific nonces for my device with TSS checker and stitched that ticket to IBSS and I booted IBSS. Then I again checked what nonces are uh, generated and I've seen nonce doesn't change. So I again stitched with uh, stitched that ticket to IBEC and booted IBEC. And again I requested the nonce and again the nonce doesn't change so this is definitely something we can work with. Yeah, we've seen we get the same nonce uh, for DFU, IBSS, IBEC. And this, is, uh, this also works if you go from iBoot to IBEC, and this is actually the route we're going to go for downgrading. You'll see why in a few slides. And also notice that the SEP nonce is completely ignored in IBSS and IBEC. It only matters uh, when booting SEP, which kind of makes sense, I guess. So, um, 
what happens if you could somehow predict or regenerate an AP nonce? Well, this is where Prometheus comes in. Let's for a second assume we somehow can predict an AP nonce. What we could do then is we would request now a ticket for a nonce, which will be generated later. And once that isn't signed anymore, we can somehow make the device magically regenerate the nonce and use the ticket we saved before. So this brings us back the old classic replay attack, and we could boot up to the RAM disk. So we can only boot up to the RAM disk because there's still Zap. We can't do this for Zap, and we need somehow to boot Zap. Well, what we can do here is we can just boot a possibly newer but signed Zap. And since it's signed, we can request a valid ticket. And we're also restoring uh, the newer but signed Zap. And we're also doing the same for the baseband. So fix everything, right? This is how Prometheus looks like. Um, yeah, when booting the stuff. First you boot to uh, ILB, then iBoot, this is checked by the AP ticket on the device. If you hold down your home button while booting, you will get into recovery mode and it will stop there. Um, then we do some voodoo magic and make the device regenerate the AP uh, nonce, which we have uh, saved the ticket for. Then we stitch that ticket to iBack and boot that. And again, the saved ticket stitch it to the remnants and the kernel and boot that. And what we're doing here is we're booting not the shipped zap, but the latest zap, for example, with a valid um, ticket, which we just requested for the nonce that generated us, and we boot that. Then we're doing a normal restore with the difference that we're restoring the AP ticket we saved. Uh, and we're restoring uh, the newer SAP with a different AP ticket. And we can do that because uh, every IMG4 file stores its own copy of the ticket. Um, yeah. Now, the only real question is, how do we predict the AP nonce? Because if we can't predict the AP nonce, we can't really use all this. Okay, let's take a look at the OTA update procedure. So uh, when you take your phone, go to settings, update, uh, what it would do, it would uh, download all the boot files and store the RAM disk in memory. It would set some boot arc and it would reboot. Uh, the RAM disk is not encrypted, the boot files are, and you need an AP ticket to boot. So you can't really request uh, an AP ticket while you're in recovery. This means you need to request a ticket before going to recovery. And we have a problem here. So there's something needed to be stored so the AP, uh, so the updater can predict what nonce uh, will be generated on next boot so we can request now uh, an AP ticket and use it on the next reboot. So all we gotta do is find this something. Well, let's take a look in NVRAM. So on the big picture, you can see a uh, kernel um, cache from iOS 10. Um, yeah, Apple was so kind to ship iOS 10 unencrypted, so we can just take a look here. And what we see here is com.apple.systembootnons. And the only thing left is figuring out what all those values mean. And if you Google, you'll eventually end up on ionvram.h on opensource.apple.com. And there you can see this uh, GOF variables, this uh, variable table. And so basically the elements here are first the string, then the type, then the permission, and the last thing is probably counter. So if we take a look at the kernel dump, we see um, uh, 0x3 and 0x3 for the type and for the permission. And if we take a look at the type, it's a uh, type string. And if we check the permission, it is permission kernel only, which is kind of bad, but it's nothing we couldn't change with the kernel patch. So patching this to permission user read would allow us to use the NVRAM tool to read and write this variable from user land. So um, yeah, how do we predict uh, IPNANS? So the generator is saved in NVRAM. Once, it is, uh, once you request from lockdown the announce, and you can do that by either uh, requesting announce with iTunes, or the updater can request announce from lockdown D. And that generator is saved to NVRAM and consumed on the next reboot. So you can't really predict uh, nonce twice, you can do just, just once. 
So this is how such a generator looks like, and it generates the following nonce on my iPhone 6. And yeah, since the permissions are kernel only, you need to patch the kernel to be able to read and write that. So this is kind of a demo, I guess. It's just an image, but still. This is my iPhone um, 6 running iOS 9.1. <laughs> And what you, what I did here is, is first I requested a nonce from Lockdown D. Then I run nvram-p to print all the variables. Then you can see we only have boot arcs, debot uarts, auto boot, and backlight, backlight level. Then uh, running nonce enable, which patches um, the kernel. And if again I run nvram-p, you can see the com apple system boot nonce magically appears, and we can read it, and we also can write it. So, is this the only way? Well, the nonce is 20 bytes. And this means we have 2 to the power of 160 different possibilities, and this is just too many to brute force. The generator, on the other hand, is 8 bytes. This is 2 to the power of uh, 64 possibilities, but this is still too many, uh, unless you're the NSA, there's even no point in trying. But I did all these calculations after I tried that, so uh, let me show you my results. So I wrote a little script. Um, basically, all it does is puts your device into recovery, uh, sets the boot arc to false, so you always boot into recovery when you reboot. Then it reads out the uh, nonce uh, and reboots. Then again, reads out the nonce and so on, and I let it run for, I don't know, two hours, and it gave me like 2,000 nonces. And if we take a look at the nonces, they are on the right side. So I ordered them, and you can see um, the first thing there is the nonce. Then in the second column, this is how often it was generated. And the last column is the percentage. So the one highlighted is in blue is not actually the one generated most often, but it's my favorite one, that's why it's blue. And <laughs> if you uh, take a look and sum all this up, you can see that Five nonces are 20%, so we can definitely work with that. We also had some uh, community test results, so I asked on Twitter, um, just take your phones and try this too, and I've seen multiple iPhone 5S generate uh, the same nonce on iOS 9.3.2 and iOS uh, 9.3.5. And this also works with multiple iPad Airs, um, on closed versions. Uh, I haven't tried 32-bit devices. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. I have tried later devices like iPhone 6, 6S, and I don't know if someone tried an iPhone 7, but those don't generate collisions. Also, the funny thing here is that uh, I have seen collisions on iOS 9.3, I have seen collisions on iOS 10, 10.1, 10 10.2, 10 but I haven't seen any collisions on iOS 9.1 and 9.0, so maybe that's something, some bug that Apple introduced in 9.3, I don't know, I haven't seen any collisions for iPhone 5S in 9.0. So it seems um, collisions are possible for some device, iOS combinations, and this can be used to downgrade without a jailbreak. So what you should do is run your own tests, um, figure out what nonce is generated the most, and get AP ticket for that specific nonce. So downgrade scenario here would be you upgrade to newer iOS and figure out what uh, nonce is generated the most often, and you need to do that because Maybe it changes what nonce is generated, and yeah. So you would request an AP ticket with that specific nonce for an older iOS, while it's still signed. Um, when Apple releases a new iOS, the older one is signed for a certain amount of time, and you, you would need to do that while the older one is signed. And when the signing window closes, you make the device regenerate the same nonce you have the ticket for, and you could downgrade. You could even chain up um, different iOS versions, like first downgrading from iOS 10 to 9, because 9.3.5 maybe generates a different uh, nonce, and then you can use the tickets with the saved nonce there, make the device regenerate another, diff uh, an another nonce, which you have the ticket for, and you could go even further. Uh, I need to say f at this point that it does work for downgrading uh, iBoot, 
but the iOS 10 SAP is not compatible with iOS 9, so if you try to downgrade iOS 10 to iOS 9 by restoring an iOS 10 SAP to iOS 9, you don't get a working uh, system, so don't do that. Well, this is cool, but Prometheus has lots of limitations and it relies on the fact that the basement, the SAP and the iOS versions are not tied together and checks for that can easily be added. Also, uh, SAP and Basement are uh, always the latest signed version, and they might not work with all the iOS versions. This is the case for iOS 10 SAP with iOS 9. Also, the AP nonce must be predictable, and Apple can make our uh, lives really hard here. They could, for example, um, add Assault in uh, iBoot and change that in every different uh, iBoot version. And since they're encrypted, there's no chance that you can get that salt. So it would kind of eliminate the, the downgrade without JREX. So um, yeah, Apple can really do lots of things here. So for future downgrades, um, yeah, saving AP tickets is always a good idea. Uh, even if you can't downgrade right now, maybe you can in future and maybe there will be n uh, new bugs and futures or new techniques. And yeah, definitely save you AP tickets. So the tools I used here is TSS Checker. TSS Checker is a tool for requesting AP tickets from Apple with uh, lots of uh, customizations. You can manually specify the AP nonce, the SAP nonce you want a ticket for, um, if you want a basement ticket, if you don't want a basement ticket, and really lots of stuff. And I haven't seen any other tool which can do that. So um, TSS Checker is cool for that. Also, IMG4 tool, uh, it is used for manipulating IMG4, IM4P, and IM4M files. You can view uh, those files, you can stitch IMG4 files, you can um, check uh, the manifest and stuff like that. Also, Future Restore, this is the actual implementation of um, the Prometheus downgrade method. So what Future Restore allows you to do is to specify the ticket you want to use, to specify the SAP you want to uh, install, and to specify the basement you want to install. And all of these uh, will be open source. CSS Checker is open source right now. Uh, IMG4 tool and Future Restore will be open source shortly after this talk. And yeah, at this point, uh, I want to thank Nikias who made AutoTool script for building Future Restore. Future Restore is a really messy pro uh, project which consists of TSS Checker, IMG4 tool, and iOS uh, iDevice Restore. It's just all packed together and made some more work. So it was really complicated to make uh, build files for that. And yeah, thank you. And now it's time for some Q&A. Thank you very much for the presentation. If there are any questions in the audience, we have four microphones at which you can line up and then I will call you. If you need to leave the room now, that's okay, but please do so quietly and take some trash with you if you can. I think the first question was at the very back of the room. Yes, please. Um, thanks. So my question is a bit generic, but uh, since you're in the scene, right? Um, why do jailbreak and, and other iOS hardware hackers never consider hacking the hardware directly? Or maybe they do. Um, I think there are people who are doing hardware hacking. I know that some people are doing hardware hacking for um, getting the firmware keys. Um, but I think um, most likely this is because hardware attacks are not really practical for the average user, so you can't tell a user, well, you need to open up the device, you need to wire those two pins, and then you have a jailbreak. So this is why I think mostly it's focused on software. All right, we're going to take one question from the internet, please. Thank you. What is the point in downgrading a device? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, 
I actually asked it myself a few times, but it seems like there are really lots of people who do want to downgrade for some reason. For example, if you use this uh, technique to downgrade without a jailbreak, right now you could, um, right now the latest signed version is iOS 10.2, and if you do all this voodoo magic, you could right now downgrade with that to iOS 10.1, and there is a jailbreak for that, so you could basically downgrade to get a jailbreak. But um, most likely you can't do this, um, so I don't know, Maybe many people say newer uh, versions are slower, so they downgrade for speed. I don't know, people just want downgrades. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to take a question from the front here. Yeah, uh, I have a question about nonsense. As far as the studio found that there are some nonsense that are much more frequent than, than others. Is that right? Yeah. And did you investigate why this could happen? Like, did you find the, the algorithm which generates them in somewhere in the firmware? Um, I haven't really looked into that part. Um, what I did is just basically tried. I figured out if you take lots of iPhone 5S on iOS 9.3 something, it would uh, generate the same nonce across the devices. But I haven't really looked into it, why they're doing that specific nonce. Um, I didn't even expect this to work at all, so I was surprised. Why does it even work? Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to take a question from the front, please. That was actually my question as well. But could I, could I just get a picture of that, non, that nonce collision slide? That was fantastic. <laughs> I think there, um, yeah. I think there are even more on a Reddit post, which there's a guy who um, I published them on my blog, and there's a guy on Reddit who put them all together in an even different statistic. I was thinking about taking that image to a presentation, but it's somewhere on uh, Reddit which devices generate collisions at, and which don't. Okay, we're going to take one more question from the internet, please. Thank you. Will it work on all 64-bit um, devices? Uh, well, I guess. Um, the only thing which would stop it from work on the iPhone 7 right now is that I haven't pulled the, um, well, what the iPhone 7 is uh, doing with the baseband, they changed the baseband and I haven't pulled the uh, iDevice Restore um, commits for handling the new baseband format. This is why it doesn't work right now on iPhone 7. Um, I don't know what the new memory protection the iPhone 7 um, does, if it stops it, if it doesn't stop it from patching, I don't know. It will probably work. Well, I assume it works with all 64-bit uh, devices. It might even work with 32-bit devices, but I never tried. Okay, question from the back. Uh, thanks for the talk. My question is um, more or less a, a dummy question. You um, showed us in the slides uh, that this work for 935 and 933. And now you said uh, by answer, um, ring, um, answering the previous question that this work with iOS 10. Uh, maybe I misunderstand something? You mean that slide, right? Uh, yes. Well, um, basically what the slide is saying that I had people with uh, iPhone 5S on 932, 933, 934, 935 and they were trying to generate a nonce, and this was the same um, across all these devices, so generated the same. But the iPhone 5S also generates um, nonces, uh, nonce collisions on iOS 10.0, 10.1, 10.2. There, um, there's a difference between 9 and 10 that they're just simply different ones, like five, five of these of iOS 9, and on iOS 10, it's just five different ones. Um, can I? Sorry, we're going to take another question from the front. Thank you for your talk. Um, still about the repeated nonces, you already answered that you haven't looked into uh, how they're generated, but is that code in the publicly uh, reversible part? Like, how hard would it be to figure out how they're generated? Well, if you boot the device and request a nonce from there, that would be a nonce generated from the bootloader, from iBoot or something. So we would probably need to dump iBoot and reverse it there, the random number generator. Uh, what I did is I took a look at the generator thing and I figured out it's just the um, the little onion encoding and if you hash that byte string, this is basically the nonce. So I focused on that, so you just take uh, eight bytes, hash that and this is the nonce. This is also what TSS checker does when saving blobs, it would 
make random eight bytes, hash them, so we know you can use that specific generator if you write it to NVRAM, it would generate the same nonce. But I haven't really looked into how iBoot generates the random nonces. Okay. But iBoot is, uh, uh, there are decrypted iBoots available for reversing, are there? I don't think that they are decrypted ones. You, uh, I know there is a technique by QWERTY where you could dump an iBoot from iOS 8 devices for 64-bit. Um, for 32-bit, there are decrypted firmers, but uh, I haven't really looked into that. On this, I have focused on 64-bit. Thank you. Okay, one more question from the internet, please. Thank you. Is it possible to get around the theft protection um, with downgrading a, a device? Uh, no, it is not, because um, after your downgrade or restore in general, you um, need to activate the device, and this is completely separated from the system. So you would need to get an activation record. This is, has nothing to do with downgrade and restoring, so now you cannot bypass theft protection. Question in the front. Yes, and earlier you said that the baseband itself was used primarily for tying devices to a specific carrier and that for a while you could drive a different baseband in iOS combinations, but then at the end you said that they were now tied together. What is actually inside the baseband? What is it being used for in modern science? Well, you have, uh, as far as I understand, the different some kind of chip and the baseband is the firmware for that specific chip. Uh, and that handles the communi uh, communication with the GSM and stuff like that. So if you want to use LTE or if you call someone, then you're using that specific uh, chip with that specific firmware, talk to that. And um, this basement is the OS of the thing that handles telephone and stuff like that. And does it have storage? Could there be cryptographically relevant information in that particular section? Um, Probably there are some carrier informations. I don't really know, but there's nothing really what the user would uh, have access to anyhow. Okay, another question in the front, please. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you about if is there a way to get a K-loader for 64-bit devices? Um, honestly, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> another question from the internet. Have you ever bricked a device? Uh, if I ever brick the device, uh, no, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Now's your chance. Yes, please. Hey, you mentioned that it wasn't possible to downgrade from 10 to 9.5, um, but then you also had a slide on chaining those downgrades. Um, can you talk about that? So, um, these slides were made uh, in the days where iOS 9 was still uh, signed. So, I wrongly assumed you can, but the really thing which is stopping you from downgrading iOS 10 to iOS 9 is that you cannot use uh, iOS 10 uh, ZEP on the iOS 9 firmware. You could finish up the restore, but at the very end of the restore it would fail. At that point, it would have already uh, written the bootloaders and iBoot, so you can boot up to recovery, but there's some stuff at the end which the restore didn't finish, so you don't have a file system. I don't know if you have a file system, but you have, don't have a phone you could use. The bootloaders are there, but that's it. Another question in the front, please. Uh, this might be a dummy question as well, but after the downgrade, are still the user data on the phone maintained or are they wiped afterwards? Um, this is a good question. This is actually a restore. So when you restore, you can um, wipe the whole data. There's also an option to upgrade where you don't actually erase the data partition. Um, I have an option in future restore which uh, sets the flag for iDevice restore to not wipe the partition but do the upgrade instead. So you could try downgrading and with that flag set so it would keep the data. But uh, I don't know if it's a good idea to do that if it would mess stuff up. I haven't tried that but maybe. Thank you. Another question from the internet. Um, thank you. Can you save the set before updating and use it um, again after you downgrade it to a previous version? Um, no, you cannot because um, when uh, the, the set, when restoring, you boot the RAM disk 
And then you also need to boot the SAP OS. So, um, and before you booted the SAP OS, you can't really um, start the downgrade. And um, it, the, the normal downgrade restores the file system and stuff, and the SAP firmware actually handles the restore process for the SAP. So, for it would restore also the SAP, and those nonces need to match. So, uh, it's a completely separate restore process. So, we can't do that. Question in the front, please. Hi. Why is the baseband so hard to exploit? Uh, I'm not saying the baseband is hard to exploit, but I have the feeling, personally, that not many people are looking into it because um, I wouldn't know what I would do with... Uh, like, it's a lot of work just so we could downgrade. I'm not seeing why would anyone should uh, would do that. In theory, you could um, exploit the baseband, you could try to downgrade that. What you also could do is you could um, patch the older... Um, iOS, um, so it would understand the newer basement API and get that somehow to work. Uh, it's definitely doable, but the easier way is just hope that it works. Thanks. Another question in front, please. Is it, um, so what software handles uh, writing the firmware to the SEP and things like that, and would it be possible to patch that in the same way that you would patch the kernel to just not write the SEP so that you'd be able to do downgrades and things like that without having to write the newer SEP? Um, I don't think you can do that just as easily. Maybe you probably need to exploit the SEP firmware and to stop it from downgrading because SEP handles a lot of stuff like uh, pseudo random, uh, a true random number generator and other things. So, I think to not update the SAP, you would need to actually exploit the SAP. But I haven't really looked into the SAP, it's just what I assume. Any other final questions? All right, so when you go, please take some trash with you, and please give another warm round of applause for Team Star.